the royal family at work on CBC. The state opening is a public spectacle too. The Queen's horses and carriages will form two processions through the streets, one for the crown jewels and one for the Queen. Long before dawn on the big day, the Royal Muse is hard at work. Yesterday we started at half past two. Today it was more between four and half past. We're just taking horses out for exercise first to make sure that they're a little bit tired because obviously there's a lot going on. So we just try and take the edge off of them before. I'm an outrider for the crown, so I'll be running a bay horse today. I'll put on the crown procession, which is quite nice because we actually need the whole thing out because we got four queens. So I might have done a state opening before. It's such an amazing feeling when you're riding out, you know, up the mall or across horse guards with the crowds. It's just unbelievable. You just ride out and there's just everybody there. And you just got these, you get little like, butterflies in your stomach, it's a little knot, and it's just an amazing feeling. You're like, I can't believe I'm actually doing this for the Queen, it's just a bit surreal really. And then you come back and you're like, did that really happen? <laughs> Was I really there? It's amazing. Every member of this mounted cast has a special costume called the full state livery. Thanks, sir. Alex Mattinson is in charge of the wardrobe. Hey, Vicky. Hey, How are you doing? The jackets on the other side are worth yeah, roughly about ten to fifteen thousand. Pretty much most of the uniforms are over hundred years old, so we're still using them even to this day because they're only used once a year. Then they, they, we pretty much get quite a lot of life out of it. So a lot of the breeches actually have names in from 1901 and things like that. to themselves and will travel to Parliament ahead of the Queen. I'm with the carriage over there, which is the Alexandra state coach, I think, with the crown in. about its business as usual. The world may change, but there is a timeless quality to the state opening of Parliament. Today's historic ritual will involve thousands of people, 1,200 soldiers, 1,500 police, and of course, all the politicians and their guests. term can only begin once the Queen has read out the government's programme for the year ahead. Because he's about to retire, this will be the last Queen's speech written by the outgoing Prime Minister, Tony Blair. I've always thought that the monarchy has a unifying role to play. And when we put on, you know, that wonderful ceremony of the state opening of Parliament, personally, I think that's great. I think people love to see it. They know it's a ceremony. I mean, they're not seriously thinking the Queen's, you know, sat down and written out the Queen's speech herself. They know, of, uh, of course, that it's a piece of pomp and ceremony. But what's wrong with that? She arrives at the royal gate, which is at the bottom of the stairs. She's greeted warmly, climbs to the top of the stairs, then goes into the royal dressing room and I think between five and ten minutes go by the doors open and the most important person in the realm is revealed and yet the most important person in the realm is a constitutional monarch it is the state in all its absolutely stunning pomp and totally illustrative of everybody's place 
in the Constitution. The judges, respectful and in order. The bishops, suitably spiritual. Everybody in their place. She summons the commons, but it is those very commons that she has summoned who, by producing the government, have required her to read that speech. The elected deliver their symbolic, historic snub to the unelected. Mr. Speaker, the Queen commands this Honourable House to attend Her Majesty immediately in the House of Peers. Have you got Helen Mirren on the standby? <laughs> the Commons shamble along from the House of Commons chamber, making a huge noise indicating that for all your grandeur and for all your pomp, in the House of Lords, we are the people who make the noise and we are the people who matter. I hand over on behalf of the government to the speech and then she reads out what it is that her government is going to do. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, my government will pursue policies aimed at meeting the challenges which the United Kingdom faces at home and abroad. A stable economy is the foundation of a fair and prosperous society. My government will continue to maintain low inflation, sound public finances and high employment. The crown jewels are back in the tower, but the constitutional role continues all year round. The Queen will soon appoint her 11th Prime Minister. For now, Gordon Brown is still Chancellor and Head of the Treasury. On the eve of his last budget speech, he comes to share the contents with the monarch. The Queen removes the corgis for the occasion. I shut the dogs up, didn't I? Oh, good man. <laughs> Think wise. It's meant to be an opportunity for her to give advice, as well as to listen. Well, what I do every year is report to the Queen uh, the night before the budget, and uh, I go through all the uh, major details, and she asks questions about what's happening, not just in Britain, but around the world. Well, what obviously uh, she'll be interested in and is interested in is the welfare of our armed forces. You know, just about every member of her family has served the country in one way or another. The Chancellor of England, Your Majesty. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. Thank you very much for meeting me today. Well, like I said, you, it's come round again awfully quickly, though, hasn't it? It has, indeed. <laughs> and uh, I have got some good information for you, and I've also got something to tell you about how we're trying to support the troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. Right. So, good. Well, and there was a family interest as well because of that. Well, exactly, because Harry is... Well, I think he's a very brave young man and uh, very courageous and uh, we'll certainly do everything we can to, to support him. But uh, I, I, thought, I thought I would say that um, the first thing I'll do in the budget is put more money for our troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and also for all the other places around the world where they're doing such a good job as yes, well. Yes, because they're, they're very pushed all around, aren't they, now, with so yeah, many places. Yeah. So we, we, would, we would put extra money mm -hmm. in for that. And I, I was in Basra, and I thought that the morale was very high. And I thought that uh, very young, but doing a great job, and very determined and enthusiastic. Yes. And the, I mean, I saw the Royal Welsh the other day, and, and they've got a lot of Black Watch volunteer to go with them. That's to, right. You know. People are keen to go. Don't I'm hoping to go to Afghanistan in the next uh, few days after the budget to see. Oh, are you? Yeah, to see how. That's <laughs> because Anne went. went she out. did, and yes. uh, that was a very good thing to do. And uh, I think these visits do help them a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think Andrew went to look at the helicopters, then, because that's yes. his, that's his favourite. <laughs> I think when you start coming to talk about the budget, you you feel that uh, you've got to present all the formal parts of the the budget in in order and in some some detail. And I think you quickly realise that what the Queen wants to know is what are the central things, and she wants to talk about 
what's happening to all the different industries and places she's visited. And she's both sympathetic and uh, very helpful to you. And at the same time, uh, she's got very good advice about some of the issues that are worrying people at the time. And I think uh, even although it's the last stage of a budget process, sometimes you go back and change a bit of your speech.